verse 14. So Matthew 27, verses 28 and 29, Revelation 14, 14. I'd like to thank the pastor for this, uh, this privilege and honor it is to bring forth the Word of God. Truly is an honor any time you can stand behind the sacred desk and bring forth the Word. But Matthew chapter 27, reading from 27 and 20, Matthew chapter 27, reading from 28 and 29. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. With the help of the Holy Ghost, I'd like to preach on this thought tonight. From the cross to the crown. From the cross to the crown. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may retain the word which you have for us, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that it would take root in our, heart, in our hearts and in our spirits, that we would be transformed in the very image of Jesus Christ, Lord. And we pray tonight, Lord, in unison, that you anoint my mind and my lips to bring forth your word, that your words would flow forth, and that they be life and life more abundantly than ever before. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. The cross itself is unique in the fact that there is nothing else like it in the entire world. The Christian cross is probably the most recognizable symbol throughout the known world. You look at it, it doesn't matter if you go to Japan, Africa, or the United States. You show them the cross of Jesus Christ, and they know immediately it is the cross of Christ. It may have several different versions. You may see the Russian Orthodox, or maybe a Catholic with a little, uh, it seems like a bar at the bottom where Christ's foot would have been. But nonetheless, it is the cross of Jesus Christ, and it is recognized worldwide. There is no, done, there is no denying what it is. We may have our shroud behind a crowd, uh, cloth of blackness right now, but there is no denying what the cross of Jesus Christ looks like. It is unique, unlike any other symbol throughout the entire known world, because it is the one symbol alone that has birthed the separation of time and space and matter. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning He was the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Before what we see came into existence, the cross of Jesus Christ was already shining in the background. The angels of heaven may not have known what that cross symbol was shining down to the earth that was without form and void, but it was there nonetheless in the background. When we look throughout time, it is that symbol that divides B.C. from A.D. It doesn't matter what the world tries to do. They might try to separate the timeline as common air and before common air but there is still one symbol that stands supreme on that timeline and that is that symbol above zero AD and it is the cross of Jesus Christ. There is no denying that it is the cross of Jesus Christ because it is the most recognizable symbol throughout all of history. If we go back during the Roman times, they knew exactly what a cross looked like. They had all different shapes of crosses. They had crosses that were X's. 
that sat on their side as the prisoners were being crucified. They got to a point in the Roman history that the, the prisoners being, were being crucified on trees for lack of ability to make houses so fast. But it doesn't matter what they looked like back then. We look at Peter when he was crucified. His Christ cross was not like the other crosses for anything. It was probably an upside down T because he wanted to be crucified upside down and history records that he was crucified upside down. But when you look at any other cross in history none compares to the cross that is surrounded behind that black cloth tonight because it is the cross of Jesus Christ. It is, unrec it is recognizable no matter how you put it. When we would go back and study the Hebrew alphabet in its rudest form, then you find that you know, the first letter would be a left, which is us. But you got all the way to the last letter, which is the 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it would be represented by the symbol of a cross, because in the rudest form, the shape of that symbol symbol that letter was that of a cross and we would study it out a little bit farther that letter for tau means mark or signature let me tell you tonight if there ever was a question on what the signature of jesus christ ever looked like it would look like that thing that is surrounded by a black cloth tonight and that is the cross of jesus christ because as we go back through the entire it's not just a recognizable symbol of christianity it's not just the most recognized symbol in the world, but that symbol right there, that cross, that cross that separates A.D. from B.C. is the signature of Jesus Christ saying, I was here and this is mine. When it comes to the Christian world tonight, let me tell you, that is not just another symbol, but the cross is the signature of Jesus Christ in this world. It is not like anything else, but it is his, it is unique, and there is none that compares to it. And we would go back during the time of Jesus Christ and look where it all began. The mark the, on history that Christ began did not begin on that cross, but rather it began a little bit back farther. Because the cross of the cross of Christ begins all the way back in a garden of Olivet in Matthew chapter 26 and 37 through 44. Where the Bible reads, and he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here, watch with me. And he went a little bit farther, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, he findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What well, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch ye and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O oh, oh, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they left them, and went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same word. The crux of the cross of Christ was not one there on the cross itself, but rather it was one back in the garden of Gethsemane. The decision for Christ that he had his mind made up to die on that cross was made back in this garden. He knew what he was entering in. He knew what was laying before him. He knew what the Father had presented to him. If you want to save these people from their sins, if you want them to come into fellowship with us once again, there's only one way to do it. That symbol that is the most recognized symbol of Christianity. You're going to have to take it up before it becomes that symbol. You're going to have to die on the cross. You must choose the cross if you want the church to ever come into existence. I'm telling you right then, the crux, the battle for the cross was won way back in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was there where the mind of Christ was made up that I'm going to go all the way. I know this is the Father's will, but go up if you would just let it pass from me. But if it does, I will gladly endure the cross. I will gladly go forward. I will gladly pick up the beam. I will gladly go marching up the hill and I will die on the old rugged tree. Cursed is the man who dies.
dies on a tree, but I'm willing to take it up. I'm willing to take up my cross. I'm willing to go up the hill. I will blaze the way for all those that come behind me, but before they must come, I must take up my cross and die upon the tree. It was there in the garden where the crux of the battle for the cross was won. And as we go a little bit farther, we find before the tree, before the crucifixion, before the cross was even brought into the eyesight of Jesus Christ physically. There were some things he had to go on before because Pilate knew he was an innocent man. There was no guilt found in him. There was no guile found in the life of Jesus Christ. And so he gave them over to do with him, to try to scourge him, to make him look pitiful, that the Jews might not have him crucified. But it did not work. And then Pilate sent him off to be crucified. But before he could get there, Matthew chapter 27, 27, this world crowned the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In Matthew 20. 727 through 31, the Bible reads, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they mocked him and they took the robe off and put his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified. These people, the Romans, before they brought him in physical view of the cross, they patted him with a crown of thorns. Before Jesus Christ took up his cross, they crowned this world, crowned him, and they mocked him, and they beat him. And it wasn't just with a crown of gold. It wasn't with a crown of silver. It wasn't with a crown of crystals or rubies or sapphires. But rather it was a crown made of thorns and thistles. If you study out, they claim that these thistles were probably about six inches long each. And they tur turned them around and they weaved a crown. And they planted it on the head of the Savior. And they beat it upon with a bruise. Read. And they said, you claim that you're the king of the Jews. Let us worship you as the king that you claim you are. And they mocked him, and they defiled him, and they spit upon him, and they made fun of him. And they said, I don't know what crown you're going to wear, but let me tell you what, what we know, that there is a wooden cross outside there somewhere waiting, and you king of the Jews, you are going to meet your fate upon that cross. These Roman guards had no idea what they were doing, but rather they were preparing him and making a mockery of the world, but they did not know what they do, for they were getting ready to crucify the Son of God. And when they took Jesus Christ upon the hill, when they finally got up to a man that was so weak and so heavy and so burdened that he was not able to bear the weight of that being, and he needed help to make it up the hill called Golgotha. We find that they get him up here, and as they're preparing to lift the cross, above the cross, his head there, they place an inscription like they would with every other thief. And when that inscription would bear upon that cross, that theft, that deed that that individual is being crucified for. And then it showed to us and it showed to the world an individual that was without guilt, that was, that was without fault, without blemish. And because of that, the only accusation, the only reason that he was guilty and deserving of that cross, according to this world, was because he claimed that he was the king of the Jews and to make sure that it was known worldwide. It was inscribed up there in the inscription, King of the Jews in Latin, in Greek, and Aramaic. It didn't matter what your background was, but when you looked upon that God man hanging upon that cross, you knew exactly why he was hanging up there. Because this world was mocking him, and that he claimed he was the Son of God, the King of the Jews. And because of that, they planted him with a crown of thorns. 
and put him upon a cross. What was it that kept Christ to the cross? It wasn't those nails. It wasn't the ropes. It wasn't the inscription. It wasn't the mockings. It wasn't the beatings. And it wasn't the bruises. The, the, but the Bible stays in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Why did he endure the cross? Why did he endure the shame? Why did he endure the beatings? Why did he endure the, the crown of thorns? Why did he endure the crucifixion? The Bible says, for the joy set before him. Why did Christ hang on the cross? Why did he endure this world's crown? It was for the church. That was the joy that was set before him. That was the battle he was wrestling with in the garden. That was the crux of the battle of the crucifixion. Was what was the joy that set, was set before him? Was it worth it, Jesus Christ? Is it worth going through the pain? Is it worth going through the turmoil when Satan was there, following him in the garden, playing mind games? Jesus, why are you doing this? Why are you enduring the cross? You know exactly what is going to happen. You know the pain that you're going to be put through. You know the words of Isaiah. You know you're going to be beaten. You know you're going to be bruised. You know you're going to be whipped. You know you're going to be scorched. Why should you endure the cross? And Jesus said, I'm going to do it for the crown that I'm going to get at the end. No, it's not the crown that are going to pat on my head there in the, um, in the, in the hall there by the guards. That is not the crown I'm talking about. It's not because of the cross I must endure. But I'm going to go through it because of the crown at the end. Because I think it was Isaiah that said that we are the crowns in the diadem. The crown, the jewels in the crown that is in the hand of the Lord. Why did Jesus Christ endure the cross? Because he was going to make it to the crown that God has set before him. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20 through 22, the Bible states, which he wrought in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead, and he set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, for above all, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. No, this verse does not say that Christ received a crown, but it does tell us where his position was, where he was granted. That is at the right hand of the Father. What is that? We know that the Father is seated in a throne in heaven. And he said, Jesus Christ, my only Son, for that which you endured, the joy that was set before you. There is a place for you in heavenly places. And it's right beside me at my right hand. And with such a position, we know that when a king sits down, what does he do with his queen? He gives her a crown. Anyone that is seated on a throne is receiving a crown in this earth system. But we know in Philippians chapter 2, and verse 8 through 11, the Bible states, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we look at this passage, because of the cross that God has given them a position that is above all positions, for he has all things under his feet. Because Jesus Christ endured the cross, he now has all power over all things. He has all dominion over all things. And he has all power over all things. Because God has highly exalted him 
and given a name that is not like any other name that is known throughout the entire universe. But it is a name that is above all names. It is a name that is recognized in every Braille language probably throughout this world. It is a name that is known in hell itself. It is a name that is mentioned that even the demons in hell tremble in fear. It is a name that is above every name. And it is all because of the cross that he endured that he may receive the joy that is set before him. And because of the cross that every tongue should confess, it doesn't matter which tongue it is. It doesn't matter which language it speaks. It doesn't matter if it's heavenly, earthly, or devilish. Every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what is the reason for it? It is because he won the battle on the cross. And because he won the battle on the cross, there is set before him a crown like no other. We look in Revelation chapter 14 and 14, and it backs it up. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, and having a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. This is the only verse besides the diadem that is in the hand of God that I can find. But it is a verse, and it only takes one, that says that he has a golden crown. Why does he have a golden crown? Because he endured the cross. And because he endured the cross, and he was found without spot and without blemish. We know that the Father had presented unto him a crown and a name and all authority over everything and all dominion and all might. And there is no God like my God, for he went from the cross all the way to the crown. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me remind you of some words that S. M. Locker said uh, some few years back. He says that my king is a seven-way king. He is the key king of the Jews. That is a racial king. He is the king of Israel. That is a national king. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of the ages. He is the king of heaven. He is the king of glory. He is the king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. It doesn't matter where you come from. But that is my king. And there is none like him. David said that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the heavens and the firmament showeth his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king, and no means of measure can divide his limitless love. No foreseen telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He is enduringly strong. He is entirely sincere. He is eternally steadfast. And he is immortally graceful. He is imperially powerful. He is impartially merciful. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, but do you know him tonight? That is the most important thing, for he went from the cross to the crown for you and I. Is he your king tonight? Do you know him? For he is the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He is God's son. He is a sinner's savior. He is a centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in the solitude of himself. He is awesome. He is unique. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He is the supreme problem in higher criticism. He is the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He is the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. He is the miracle of the age. He is the superlative of everything good that you could choose to call him. He is the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. Do you know who he is tonight? He is the one that left the throne room of heaven that he had to humble himself to be in, to come down, to die, to be the sacrifice for you and I. He is the only one that was willing to go from a cross that he may receive the crown of the church. Do you know him tonight? He supplies strength for the weak. He is available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He seals the sick. He cleanses the leper. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. 
He, believes, he defends the few. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the me. I don't know what you're talking about tonight, but that is thy king. He's the one that left the heaven to come to the lowly earth. The creator came down to the creator. Those, that creation that he created, if it humbled him to hell, standing in heaven, how much more do you think it brought it, took it for him to come down to a sin-filled earth? But he left heaven to go to the cross that he may receive the crown. That is my king tonight, because his office is manifold, his promise is sure, his light is matchless, his goodness is limitless, his mercy is everlasting, his love never changes, his word is enough, his grace is sufficient, his reign is righteous, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. He is indescribable tonight. It don't matter what word you can try to use to describe God, but there is none like it. No, there is no word in the English language. There is no word in the Greek language. There is no word in the Aramaic language. There is no word in the Devilish language. There is no word in the heavenly language to describe my God because he is all supreme. He is all powerful. And you cannot... He is incomprehensible. He is invisible. He is irresistible. He can't get him out of his mind, out of your mind. You can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. It doesn't matter who's in government at the time, because he's not like our president, and he's not like any other king, because you cannot impeach him, and he's never going to resign. That's my king. I don't know who you're serving tonight, but my king left heaven. He came down and chose the cross, and because of the cross, he has a crown tonight. And there is no kingdom on earth, and there's no kingdom in hell that can stand against my God. Because that's my God. He is the supreme. He is the Alpha and Omega. And He is the end. He is the beginning. He is the end. And when it seems like there is no more, He is the Amen. He is all finality. There He is all and all. As Sister Beth comes to the piano tonight, if you still don't know who I'm talking tonight, he is the king in Isaiah, chapter 6 and verse 1. That states in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. What is that train? That means that every battle he came up against with, he won. Every depression, every sickness, all cancer, all depression, any suicide demon, any oppression of the enemy. It doesn't matter what you're facing. He already has it conquered. If we go back to the physical world we're living in, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 4 represents Babylon as a lion, lion with angel's wings. Let me tell you, that man of majesty that a lion has, oh, our king has already cut the lion's mane and made a show of him openly. And while there may be some remnant, there's coming a day he's going to put the final blow through the line and cut off those angels' wings. He's going to make a bare skin rug out of the meat of Persian Empire. He's going to take those four-headed leopards of the Grecian Empire and mount it on his wall. Oh, that nondescript beast, the Bible says. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, says, And I saw the night visions, behold a fourth beast, Dreadful and terrible and extremely strong, and it had great iron teeth and devoured and breaking pieces and stepped in the residue with the feet and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before, and they had ten horns. That nondescript beast that even John could not find words to describe, Jesus had already conquered it, and he's got to slay it in the end days when this world system gathers itself up to face him on Mount Megiddo. When the kings of this world said, I am going to stand against the king of kings and the Lord of lords. My Bible says my king is going to come down riding a white horse and with the word spoken out of his mouth is going to slay the enemy. He's going to kill his enemy. So much so, all the men in the blood shall flow for 200 miles up to the horse's ride and he will put all enemies on your foot on that day. That is my king. That's the king that the armies of heaven wait for. That's the king that was prophesied by Enoch when he 
said that he shall come back with 10,000 of his angels. That's my king. And as he returns, you can all hear the immortal words of the apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1 17. Now unto the king, the eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Who is your king tonight? My king went from the cross, and now he has a crown. Is that your king tonight? You know, it doesn't matter what trials we face in this life. If he's your king, Isaiah showed us the battle's already won. If he's your king, it doesn't matter what the enemy may whisper. Because Isaiah showed us who Christ is. He already has that battle won. You see, the king's throne that built the temple. Every time a king conquered another king, he would cut off his train and attach it to his train. And as he won more and more victories, that train would grow longer and longer and longer. There is a train tonight that fills the throne room of heaven. Whatever your battle is tonight, whatever you need tonight, the battle's already won. But let's take it to the one who holds the crown. Whatever you need tonight, why don't we find ourselves a place around the altar? Say, Lord, you're my king. All of heaven and earth is subject to you. All power and authority is in your hand. I'm laying it at your feet tonight, and I am not taking it back. 